Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. I'd like to start out by sending a huge thanks to Qualcomm for their support of the podcast and for sponsoring today's episode. As you're here in my conversation with Jeff, Qualcomm is taking a systems approach to helping the industry address the challenges associated with AI on mobile devices and at the edge. In support of their Snapdragon chipset family, which powers some of the latest and greatest Android devices, Qualcomm provides their own suite of software tools and is also actively supporting a variety of partner and industry projects, including the Android Neural Network APIs, TensorFlow Lite, the Tiny ML Initiative, and the Open Neural Network Exchange, or Onyx, ecosystem. To learn more about Qualcomm's AI research, platforms, developer tools, and ecosystem support, visit twimmelaicom slash Qualcomm. A quick community update before we dive in. Many of you are aware that we've been hosting a couple of paper reading meetups in conjunction with the podcast. Well, I'm excited to share that Matt Kenny, Duke staff researcher and longtime listener and friend of the show, has stepped up to help take this group to the next level. The paper reading meetup will now be meeting every other Sunday at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time to dissect the latest and greatest academic research papers in machine learning and AI. If you want to take your understanding of the field to the next level, please join us this Sunday, July 4th, or check twimmelai.com slash meetup for more upcoming community events. We've also got a couple of study groups currently running, with one group working through the Fast.ai Deep Learning from the Foundations course, formerly known as Deep Learning for Coders Part 2, and another working through the Stanford CS224N Deep Learning for Natural Language Processing course. These study groups just started and we'll be working on these courses through October and November respectively, so it's not too late to join in. Sign up on the meetup page at twimmelai.com meetup. Hi everyone, I am on the line with Jeff Gelhar. Jeff is VP of Technology and Head of AI Software Platforms at Qualcomm. Jeff, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here and thank you for having me, Sam. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. Let's jump right in and chat a little bit about your background. You have spent 30 years at Qualcomm uh, thus far, is that right? That, that's that's right. Um, not in a linear sort of fashion. I, I like to say I'm on my second tour of duty and we can talk about how I came and went. Um, but yes, I've been here a, a long time since seeing sort of the long arc of Qualcomm's innovation capacity. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, some of the things you've done at the company and how you've come to uh, get involved in their AI software efforts. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So I started um, as a young engineer um, a few years after the company got started. And so I've had the pleasure of seeing the company go through ups and downs and challenges and, and innovate in first in CDMA, uh, before that in other communication vehicles, and then move on to you know 3G and 4G and now 5G wireless standards. And I spent a lot of my career um, working in wireless both in hardware and software. I worked on, on ASICs and semiconductors, but most of my career has been in systems and software work. And then um, as a part of a divestiture uh, that Qualcomm went through in uh, you know the late 90s, um, I um, left Qualcomm. It was end of two or one and ended up landing at a small um, startup. Um, actually, I didn't know that they were sort of doing what we would today consider sort of machine learning with support vector machines and so on, but that's what they were doing. And um Joined them and ran engineering for that company. Um, did commercial work uh, for the government and for Fortune 500 companies. But and that was my first exposure to sort of AI and machine learning, let's say, in the modern age. And mm -hmm. so I learned a lot there. And um, then came back to Qualcomm when that company, we sold that company and came back to Qualcomm. And then again, rejoined wireless and spent, I spent a, a good chunk of the last, uh, you know, 15 years, 16 years I've been back um, in wireless. And then 
Um, I got a chance to, I was asked to help co-lead a project that had gotten started in spiking neural networks. So we, we had made an investment in a small company. Uh, we did a joint research program with this company. What was that company? That company is Brain Corporation. It's still uh, going well here in San Diego. Uh, Qualcomm Ventures took an investment in them, and they've since gone on to do sort of automated robotics and vision systems. Um, but we did early work with them on the pretext of, and in conjunction in some sense with the DARPA Synapse program. It was actually sort of at the end of the Synapse program, but we were taking a lot of those similar ideas, like IBM was at the time as well. And um, really tried to see if we could build sort of biologically accurate systems, vision systems in, in this case, um, in the way that we think of deep learning today, but sort of predating sort of this uh, Krzyzewski kind of, you know, aha moment. And when that happened, when in 2011, 2012, you know, it kind of became obvious that these deep neural networks had you know, hit upon something, right? It resurrected, you know, backprop and hit upon something. Um, we moved the program away from spiking neural networks as all kinds of challenges. Um, and it um, subsequently, um, subsequently we evolved into a deep learning uh, ANN kind of program. That was dur during my time in Qualcomm research. Okay. What um what what has happened in the last few years is that the work that we did there, I left, went over to our commercial group, now run our commercial AI software, and what is we think of now as Qualcomm AI research has grown and continued based on that sort of initial work, and um, now we're sort of partners. They work on long term research and bring innovations that we then bring to products, and we work with our. SOC uh, channels and our customers that are using our SOCs to help them, you know, do AI on uh, on our on our chips. Okay, and for folks that are interested in hearing a bit more about what's happening from a research perspective at Qualcomm, uh, they might be interested in checking out the recent interview with Max Welling. Uh, that is Twimmel Talk 267 uh, from back in May. Uh, but that was a great conversation, uh, as I'm sure this one will be. Um, you mentioned the, the spiking neural networks work. I don't think Max and I got into any of that kind of stuff. And it's come up, you know, maybe superficially uh, on the, the show once or twice. But I don't think I've ever got anyone to kind of share, you know, who's worked in it to share a little bit of background on that. Is that something you can maybe spend a few minutes with, on? Sure, sure. I have to dust off some old memories, but I'll, I'll see what <laughs> I can do. Um, so, okay, so the, the basic idea was, you know, in some sense, um, this basic intuition that neural networks are made of, you know, stacks of neurons and they're interconnected somehow. And there are these um, learning mechanisms where the strength of the connections is, you know, somehow related to the experience, if you will that the neurons get just like an artificial neural network in some sense. Mm -hmm. But the gentleman who started brain core, Eugene Isakevich had written a book about how to mathematically model the basic uh, 20 or so uh, synaptic behaviors as we understand them in, in mammals, let's say. And the visual system is the most well sort of studied part of our cortex. And so that was the premise of, um, and what I would say is that was kind of our, seed moment for Qualcomm to get started in what has now sort of become a clearly a revolution in computation. And so it was a, a bet, it was a really early stage bet that the next computing evolution would be in this general direction. Um, and we thought, hey, look, well, the brain does this amazing thing in 20 billion neurons and 20 watts, let's say, roughly speaking. Um, gee, could we build some kind of computing machine that kind of works like that. And so we did, and we had some early success, and we built a large-scale um, like training and simulation kind of environment. And we did work in FPGAs to actually build hardware, you know, design hardware for such a machine. And what it really, I think if you boil it down to where it didn't work, it worked in a lot of ways, but where it didn't work is backprop. There's, there was no sort of fundamental... Um, principled way to train these networks in a way that produce stable output. And so you mm -hmm. see that maybe a little bit with GANs, you see that maybe a little bit with the struggles people have with RNNs and, and related things. But right. this was on a massive scale. You could you could train small scale networks to do very, very simple things like be tricked into optical illusions that human 
visual cortex systems can be tricked into. Okay. Um, but oh, that's an interesting use case. Yeah. As you try, <laughs> well, it was kind of a concept of like, were we kind of on the right track? And so you could do this yeah. very simple, like you, you atten- think about an intention mechanism. If you stare at an object, your visual system will start, you know, looking for changes and lines and edges and changes in light. And you could get the system to kind of do that same sort of thing. If it stared at an object long enough, the object would sort of vanish because you don't have any, um, you know, psychotic eye movement or anything to sort of stimulate the neurons. Um, but as you try to build like a real thing to say a visual system or an object recognition system mm-hmm. at that kind of scale, they just were super hard to train. And so there were limits um, and they're basically, you know, fundamental limits that, that systems like ANNs with backprop basically solve for us today, mm-hmm. right? And and what so does the spiking sense. refer to in spiking neural networks? Yeah, so literally the sort of the 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 idea that in a in a synapse, right, it, in a neuron, in a biological neuron, it is you know, gets all this input, think about it like a sort of sigma delta kind of time coded input. You get a little bit of stimulus, a little bit of stimulus. And when it reaches some kind of threshold, depending on the kind of neuron, it fires, it sends a signal, you know, down uh, to the next neuron or next neurons, however it's connected. And it's got some kind of decay function, right? So you can think about these not being like a step function most of them aren't they've got some kind of exponential sort of decay function so when we think of spiking uh, one of the intuitions was for low power it was like only stimulate the neurons that are implicated in some transaction right um and modeling them biologically in a biologically accurate way in terms of how real neurons collect input and then you know fire right discharge their output to the next downstream neuron because of course your brain is not Alien neurons are not active all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's when we think of spiking, what we really mean is, you know, what is that impulse function when you reach the, you know, exit threshold, if you will, of the neuron? What is that impulse? You know, what is the output? And at what point does it reach that output? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and have you followed the work in this field? It, it still comes up. Um, so I imagine there's... You know, there's some progress that's been made. Uh, do you have a sense uh, for where we are today? Well, the, the I do follow it a little bit when it comes up in various you know journals and, and blogs and so on. Um, I, I still feel like we're at a place where, in some sense, we don't have a fundamentally principled way to train these kinds of systems. And I guess it, over time, <laughs> do we I've have come- that for uh, for regular deep neural networks? Well, okay, so <laughs> we could put some parameters around that, but we have backprop. So yeah. we have a, a structured way of propagating these errors, of tuning, right, the strengths, mm-hmm. uh, uh, biases, if you will, of all these connections. But I think that part of it is that um, what I think artificial neural networks have shown us so far, you don't need anything as complicated as actually modeling the biology of a neuron to achieve some pretty impressive results. In the same way that airplanes, and this is probably an old analogy, but in the same way that airplanes don't flap their wings, right. um, you know, it's likely that we can build, they're still very complicated systems, but systems that don't work quite like the brain works and achieve maybe similar results, right? And so most of the work I think in spiking has moved in the direction of things like hardware architectures that are event driven. There are quite a number of efforts in that area Um, and using those kinds of architectures to basically map artificial neural networks onto substrates that are more energy efficient or more computationally efficient in some way by applying like an attention mechanism. Right by applying a different way of computing these things by using analog circuitry in a lot of cases. So different strategies where the angle is more about low power or more about um, you know activating only the parts of the network that need to be activated at a given point in time. So that was, I think, quite a digression in your <laughs> bio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there you go. You want the arc of how we end, how I ended up here, and that's how I ended up here. Awesome. Awesome. And so today, uh, maybe dive a little bit deeper into your current role and some of the things that Qualcomm is working on from a software perspective. Sure, sure. Um, so 
as part of this, going back a little in the bio, as part of this early research we were doing, we started on things like face detection and object detection. And this led us to buy some companies and set up some additional research offices and so on. And part of that effort is we realized, and this you know predates a lot of um, other movers here, it predates TensorFlow Lite and so on. We, we realized that in order for us even to in, experiment internally to do this on Qualcomm Snapdragon SOCs, we needed some kind of toolkit to, you know, run all these kernels on our GPU, for example, or on our DSP. And so we started and we built what now you can go to the developer network and download the Snapdragon Neural Processing SDK, and um, but an early version. And we targeted it at internal use cases mostly and for evaluating our research. And it started to become clear that our customers were coming to us and saying, hey, you know, I've got an AI thing I want to try to run. I, I saw your demo. I, I didn't realize you could do this and this and this on an edge device, on a mobile device, on a phone. Um, can we have that toolkit, basically? You have a toolkit. And so that led us to commercialize a toolkit. Um, and so today, my role is to lead a global organization that commercializes our AI software stacks, not just that toolkit, uh, but our overall AI software stacks, in order to make it ex- our hardware, basically, our high-performance SOCs accessible to internal and external customers who want to run you know, AI-powered solutions on our SOCs. And so um, that what that really has taken a form of is that we, um, our architecture and our chips is heterogeneous. Um, not every core or every use case lends itself to you know, every piece of hardware, depending on what your use case is. And so um, we provide high performance solutions, uh, principally targeting our GPU, our Hexagon DSP, and in our flagship parts, our HTA or Tensor Accelerator core. And then we provide access, high performance access to those hardware blocks, either through our SDK um, or through Android NN API, which is you know Google Android's newest uh, sort of neural network API and framework. And recently at Google I.O., we announced direct work with the TensorFlow Lite team to power uh, the back end of TensorFlow Lite with our Hexagon um, neural network accelerator library. Mm-hmm. So that those are examples of where we're building these high-performance AI software blocks and then exposing them via various ecosystem you know strategies based on you know what the ecosystem you know needs for that for those use cases. You know, when you kind of take a step back and look at this landscape uh, with, you know, similar functionality being exposed via these varying APIs, the, you know, you mentioned a bunch of them, the Android and an APIs, uh, TensorFlow Lite, you know, you've got your own, you know, stack that a developer can interact directly with, as well as, you know, that supports these other things like, What's the best way to make sense of all that if you're a, you know, a developer, a machine learning engineer that needs to deploy stuff out to a device? How do you know what you should be using? Yeah, that's um, that's a great question. And, and, and we face a lot of those kinds of questions. Um, it, you know, it's hard to make a universal um, recommendation, but I could give a little bit of guidance. I would say that maybe 18 months ago, the question, if you'd asked a question similar to it, it would be, which training framework do I use? Because the question was really about this kind of explosion of training frameworks that mm-hmm. had happened, right? We do still and now, have are we talking about kind of uh, TensorFlow versus PyTorch versus something else? Sure. It was it was PyTorch. It was which didn't exist at the time. By the way, eighteen months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, cafe. So, but today, or... yeah, Cafe, Cafe Two, uh, TensorFlow, now PyTorch, mm-hmm. uh, MXNet, uh, CNTK from Microsoft, and then you know if you think about it, you think even globally. Then in Asia, there's Tainer. a list. There's Chainer, and there's Parrot, and there's you know all kinds of you know proprietary Mace. Uh, from from Xiaomi, m- proprietary and quasi-proprietary frameworks that are out there. And so one of the things that we tried to do early on was to pick a few. We couldn't support them all and provide converters from those uh, frameworks to our 
SDK so that customers didn't have to, in some sense, make some of these choices. They could tr they could train in TensorFlow if they wanted. They could train in Cafe. Um, and then you can convert your network from those frameworks into something we we understand and it can accelerate for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so part of it was just, you know, making it easier. Now, in the process, Onyx came along um, in part to address this issue of, look, I've got all these training frameworks and I don't have a way to move between them. And I sort of get locked in with the operators or the techniques that that training system, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe use. And then I have exactly this problem. Oh, I, I want to run on you know, this SOC, but I tr started in you know TensorFlow and they don't support that operator in TensorFlow. And so what would really, the advice I'd give people is, look, there are... Um, a lot of training frameworks, but there's maybe three or four max that are really robust and, and popular. A lot of the toolkits are going to, you know, find their way through one of those into, um, you know, either our SDK or let's say through TensorFlow Lite onto our SOC. And so, you know, the funnel is getting narrower. You will have a rich choice of training environments a lot of them are doing these eager mode, very Pythonic kinds of environments. And mm -hmm. then when you're ready to deploy to your edge device, your phone, your IoT device, your automobile, there'll be an on-ramp, right? And then our right. job is to make that make that network run as fast as possible in a you know power constrained kind of environment that, that a lot of these applications face. So in other words, the the story today is more like Look, choose one of the popular frameworks that maps to the experience that you want to have as a developer. Um, you know, a la the differences between TensorFlow versus PyTorch versus something else. And, you know, we'll build essentially middleware that ensures that, you know, that framework that you're using can take advantage of transparently to you you know, all the things the underlying chipset is capable of. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. That's exactly kind of our perspective is to reduce the friction for our users, customers, partners to go from, you know, where they're comfortable onto high performance solutions on our on our devices. Yeah, I forget the time frame you threw out there, but, you know, historically it was really all about kind of tr this training experience is the follow on to that that today it's more about inference? Well, okay, so I'll make a twist on this. Yes, it's about inference uh, in the sense that there are uh, you know billions of devices that people want to run some kind of AI powered inference solution, you know, whether it's a camera, whether it's um, you know audio like translation, like you know Google Home, like uh, you know, all the, the explosion of audio use cases we're seeing. Um, I would characterize that training on device, and I will characterize this a little bit more, more subtly, um, what I'll call personalization of the experience is something that I think will become important and we're starting to see and we're starting to make investments in that direction. We have done it in the past. We know it's possible. I want to personalize like how my gallery is organized or something in yeah. my phone. Okay, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, I think the next evolution of personalization will be about things like really contextualizing the experience of my device to me, to my preferences, to how I use the device. I don't, we're not there yet, but I would characterize, in my view, the training aspect to be less about you know big data and you know massive data sets, um, and more about taking like if you will a vanilla experience and then personalizing that vanilla experience out of the box experience into something that feels a lot more um, customized right to your experience right on this personalization point this is a really interesting point that uh i've been curious about for a while do you have a sense for kind of how this is done today you know for example you know think about an app like you know gmail that is doing it the predictive re replies or even now as you're typing like predicting the end of your sentences you know presumably they built out some language model there and it's able to do you know it's able to predict based on uh you know tons and tons of data that they've got of people's emails and that's a whole separate issue about like <laughs> 
the, the yeah. privacy issues associated with that, et cetera. But the, you know, but it, it also is kind of appears to be personalized to me in the sense that I think it kind of replies in the way that I tend to reply as opposed to like just some generalization of what everybody does. And so how does that, you know, how are folks achieving that today, um, you know, with machine learning models on devices? Well, okay. So I'd say that, um, you know, you've really hit on a, what I'd can still consider sort of a big data use case. Um, and I'd hate to speculate exactly how Google is doing this, you know, kind of behind the scenes in Gmail. Um, I think the personalization on device is relatively nascent. I think this is one of these emerging, you know, things to watch and to come back in a year or 18 months and talk about and where, where it's moved. Mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing some... I'll put them in the personalization category, uh, and maybe people don't think about it this way, but nascent things like um, like the ability for you to have fingerprint or face unlock, right? That's a personalized thing. You have a generic feature, face unlock, but it unlocks for your face or your fingerprint, right? Mm -hmm. um, speaker identification, right? So the ability for a device to know that you're Sam and I'm Jeff because I've we've said 10 keywords or five keywords and it picks up, builds a pattern, right? It's doing that with let's say building a, some kind of classifier uh, by using the features of the built-in model and then running a classification pass over this, right? These kinds of things we know are possible. We've done them ourselves on device. What I think the next revolution will be much deeper integration. What is the, it's not just a single app. It's like, what is the sort of uh, experience of, um, of the device really looking at how you interact with a lot of different kinds of data and then drawing some personalization right. experiences out of that, right? Um, so that, ain't going back to the privacy thing, so that in the long arc of it, these things don't require, you know, massive amounts of cloud data, for example, right? To In order to get that sort of more intimate experience. Yeah, I feel that there's like, I'm, I'm struggling with the right language to describe this problem space. And maybe it's because it's so new, we don't have it yet. But, uh, you know, if you or if anyone else who's listening to this, you know, does have it, you know, get in touch. But like, it strikes me that there are different classes of use case here, like the face ID and voice ID strikes me as like uh, it's a relatively simple use case, uh, you know, where you, you kind of train this classifier and it's, I don't know, I, the, the word monolithic is, is, comes to mind, you know, but it seems like there are this, uh, these other use cases, maybe more like Gmail, where what you want to do is kind of akin to some kind of hierarchical model where you've got like the, it's almost like a, edge transfer learning kind of thing where mm -hmm. you've got the the master model, but then you want to fine tune that model based on, you know, a set of data that is available on the device. And maybe I, I may be blurring a bunch of lines here because your, my Gmail data is all in the cloud. And, uh, but the independent of where the, the data is, there's like a data set that's pers that's very personal. And then uh, a model that's based on a bunch of people's data. So Google talked a, a bit about this kind of approach. Um, it's not a new idea, but I think, you know, it may be closer to being put into practice. They uh, discuss a little bit at Google I.O. about, for example, um, Gboard um, mm -hmm. and uh, this, uh, you know, the federated learning and how do you do federated learning? And so what I think you just described in some sense is a federated learning use case, right? Mm -hmm. And the example they gave, I thought was, was very, uh, very interesting. You know, you could think about it like, crowdsourcing, and it is that, uh, but then, you know, applying machine learning to it, which is if some new term gets hot and a lot of users start tweeting a hashtag or some new, you know, term gets coined because of news or politics or who knows what, mm -hmm. then, you know, in today, you might have to type that, I don't know, I'll pick a number, 50 times or something before the, your learning keyboard goes, you know, this guy types his word a lot over and over and over again. Maybe <laughs> right. I should remember it, right? Right. And if you could crowdsource in some sense, right, if you could like update the predictive model by sourcing, and we've done some research here in privacy preserving uh, federated learning um, in a privacy preserving kind of way, then you can 
ideally, you know, climb that sort of hill in terms of the importance of new terms much more quickly, right? Maybe in hours or days. Oh, right? wow. Yeah, that's super interesting. Right? And I think that that kind of application is going to be, and now this is, we're drifting away from personalization into privacy, distributed learning and so on. But mm-hmm. there are interesting applications, I think, in like healthcare, for example, uh, similarly. Um, you know, my individual experience Um, is like a tiny, tiny fraction of the collective experience of a lot of users using the same medicine or with the same symptoms or, you know, whatever it is, right? If I can aggregate that data in a privacy preserving, you know, assured kind of way, then I get a benefit if I can share my experience with others and I can get back personalized recommendations, or I can be told, hey, look, your symptoms are a lot like this other person over here, and we just diagnosed this other person with such and so. Um, You know, you can think about other, you know, life-improving sorts of experiences that rely essentially on the same property, which is an aggregation of a lot of individual pieces of data, and you could get a personalized, in some sense, you know, experience out of that. So we were talking about inference before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got a little afield. Sorry about that. No, no, it's awesome. Uh, but uh, I think that led us to led us to personalization. Um, one of the questions that I had, I was at the launch for the the Cloud AI 100 back in April, which is uh, for those that don't know or don't recall Qualcomm's kind of foray into data center. Uh, inference chips uh, or systems, um, and I'm curious is, is you know to what degree you know your teams are starting to think about how all of this you know software stack applies you know similarly or differently in, to the data center devices. Sure, sure, yeah. So um, work with that team a, a little bit. I think um, the um, that's a complicated. It's a complicated answer. So again, like the question we discussed earlier about what does it mean to you know what is a recommendation for when somebody wants to run an inference on an edge device and do they start in TensorFlow or PyTorch? All those questions and then some come up in the data center um, because, of course, you have a really expensive capital you know, investment in a data center. And a lot of these kinds of customers are committed to PyTorch or they're committed to TensorFlow or they're committed to a proprietary framework. Um, And so we have very analogous um, issues um, in in order to enable that server chip um, in the data center and to provide our customers. Again, the goal is the same. You pick your training system, let's say TensorFlow, and um, we want to provide high performance, in this case, inference in the first generation product um, at you know high density, lower power, all the things that you heard about in the pitch. Um, and how do we do that kind of in a, a frictionless sort of way? And so um, uh, let me make maybe a few points here. W- one is the problems are analogous. And so we can share our experiences, and we do, um, between how we've seen the edge inference dynamics evolve um, as the marketplaces become somewhat more mature and, you know, what kinds of questions and needs customers will have as they bring their problems to these devices. So that's one area where I think um, it's, again, it's very analogous and our goal will be very similar, which is provide the lowest friction path that we can for people to bring their cloud inference tasks to our devices. But linking a lot of stuff that Qualcomm does to does well that we're invested in and and thinking about Qualcomm as a company that does really well with end-to-end very high complexity system problems, right? When you think about a wireless system, it's not just the device, the chip in the handset, it's the standards, it's the radio, uh, you know, protocols, it's what happens at the base station versus what happens at the edge de- device, the whole thing. When you kind of zoom out and you say, how is this going to fit with AI? then you have a really, really very complicated and very interesting uh, situation that I think few companies in the, in the world are really well positioned to sort of look at the whole thing. And that's if I've got an inference chip in the cloud or at the, let's call it heavy edge of the radio access network, and I've got a bunch of edge devices, whether it's their phones or their IoT devices or their cars, 
and I connect it all with 5G or Wi-Fi or both, now what happens, right? And so these are the kinds of problems we're starting to think about. How do we enable customers to apportion their use case between their edge device, their, you know, maybe edge compute and the cloud? They're going to have different latencies. The closer you are to the edge of the 5G network, you have very, very low latency, super high bandwidth. So maybe you can do things like AR and VR split rendering very easily, right? So you have lighter weight, you know, headsets that take advantage of massive compute not that far away. Maybe similarly, you can do this kind of stuff with, uh, you know, voice translation and other kind of hard use cases. You do a certain amount of it on device and then you send the rest of it over 5G to another inference solution that's not so far away in terms of latency. These are the kinds of problems we're starting to think about to kind of go beyond just, okay, how do we enable our customers to run on our devices in the cloud and in the edge, but then how do we help them start to assemble you know, real systems that take advantage of all of these building blocks that we have to offer them? Yeah, as we've talked about on the software side, it's not just Qualcomm, like there's tons of... Uh, initiatives. Uh, one of them that we talked a little bit about before we started rolling here was uh, Tiny ML. Uh, yep. What's going on with that? Uh, what, what is it, and uh, what's what are the goals there? We we had a first ever, uh, hopefully annual. I think it'll be annualized. A conference uh, co-chaired between Qualcomm and Google uh, a couple months back. Uh, the Tiny ML conference, and you can. Look at for it in LinkedIn, and there's some you know websites and so on uh, that we can link you to. And um, the idea there is to think about really low power, really um, simple devices, right? And so, for example, working with uh, Pete Warden at Google, um, he's made sort of this recent push on um, on sort of microcontroller size devices to run ML. And uh, again, it um, at the TensorFlow Summit a few months back, um, he showed a real simple, you know, microcontroller-powered board that could do uh, wake word detection and so on in very, very small footprint. So this is a like a logical extension of the work that we're already doing, uh, you know, moving, you know, all the way from the server we were just talking about out to mobile phones and then out even farther to you know, microcontroller size devices, whether it's a sensor, temperature sensor, um, you know, some other kind of really simple device, um, you know, what does it take to do machine learning there? Can you run TensorFlow Ultralight there? Can you do it in, you know, 30, 40, 50K of memory? You know, how many MIPS does it take? So this requires um, innovation in the software frameworks, you know, how do you actually, you know, build a library that's that small that can do something meaningful? And, Google and, and others they're working with are, are making progress there. What kind of hardware should you have? So you think about, again, these really simple, low power, maybe you want a device that'll run a year or two years or three years on a battery, right? Can you do that? Um, this is the direction that we're doing. We're partnering with, uh, you know, academia and with, um, with people like Pete Warden and his team at Google and starting to explore this. And over the course of time, this will lead us to hardware innovations and software innovations to solve, you know, machine learning problems on these really, really small devices. It also brings me to another point I wanted to mention um, that kind of going back to my roots on around Qualcomm AI research and the product side is a lot of our research focus is on these kinds of problems. How do you compress a network, quantize a network, you know, compactify it, if you will, in some way? And how do you make the software systems, the, the frameworks, what you call the middleware, I think it was a good term, how do you make those lean and small so they don't take up a lot of memory and they provide a lot of computation? And then how do you innovate on the hardware so that it all goes together as a system? So I've got a compression scheme that leverages something I'm doing in hardware that takes advantage of, you know, how my frameworks are set up. And then how do I go from TensorFlow or PyTorch through that whole chain of events to get onto a device to do a meaningful amount of AI in a power constrained kind of situation? I guess you said something that suggested the middleware being on device or taking up uh, device resources versus being a part of the development stack, you know, that's running on the, you know, the developer workstation uh, is you know, to what degree is that the case that, you know, as you're layering all of these 
uh, elements, you know, they're all contributing to kind of the resource taking, you know, using resources on device? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's 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 an area we focus on a, a lot. And again, I, I want to highlight for your for your listeners, I think a really interesting um, kind of area of innovation, something to keep an eye out on, is going back to this question about inference. It has been mostly the case that the pipeline has looked something like you train in your favorite framework, and this is true not of not just of our frameworks, but the other SOCs in the marketplace have very similar strategies. You train in your favorite framework, you do some amount of quantization, compression, optimization, call it what you want, and you deploy to your edge device and that middleware, that runtime, whether it's TensorFlow Lite or it's a proprietary one, has to take that graph, that model, and interpret it in some way. So whether it arrives in a open format like TensorFlow Lite's format or it's a proprietary format, you have to read it, you have to deploy it to your hardware, accelerate it, whatever, run it over your blast library, whatever your acceleration mechanism is. And so basically you're interpreting this graph on the fly, um, which is really handy if you're uh, an app developer, let's say, and you want to provide an in-store app that has machine learning. Very, very hard to predict you know, to, to build an app that's tailor-made for Snapdragon, this chip or whatever, you really want a pretty general purpose toolkit. And that's what something like Android and an API provides. Mm -hmm. But if I want to hit a microcontroller or I want to hit a purpose-built device, like it's a home speaker, I know what it will do. It will listen to wake words, it'll do translation or whatever, and it'll talk to the internet for the things it can't do, talk to the cloud. I have a very, you know, price-conscious sort of, customer and the bomb is really important i want high performance bomb huge, bill of materials the bill of materials right device. yeah yeah how much it costs them to manufacture it and how much a consumer is willing to spend to buy you know 10 of them or five of them for their house let's say mm -hmm. and um and there what we're what we're heavily involved in now let's say particularly for our hexagon um dsp is compiler technology Mo making our middleware a lot more modular so that you can pull out of the accelerator library just the parts you need for your use case and compilers and making these things all work in conjunction with each other. So to long answer to your question, um, we're, I, I think if the future world will be a little bit separated. You'll have these cases where I, I, I won't know in advance what my model needs to do. This is the App Store use case. And I need to provide middleware that's as lean as possible, but yet provides a very generic experience so I can essentially run any network that a customer might deploy to my device. And another world of these from from microcontroller up to some you know larger device where I have the network in advance, I know exactly what it needs to do. And so therefore I can spend a lot of time compiling and optimizing it like you would with a piece of software. I can distill the network in some way, I, both architecturally like compressing it or quantizing it. But then my middleware then is assembled, if you will, based only on the operators that that network requires for that use case, right? And so I end up with a very compact um, but still high performance experience, right? And so these are other areas in which we're making investments and, and working with the ecosystem to innovate. And you can expect to, f over the course of time, for us to provide tooling that will allow our customers to essentially compile their networks into libraries that are sort of custom built for their use case. Hmm. Do you envision uh, a, a future where uh, maybe... You know, the answer is that this has been happening for years, but, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, the step beyond kind of compiling down to, you know, standard uh, chipsets or SOCs might be compiling kind of the neural network down to some kind of HDL that can be implemented, you know, via FPGA or some other kind of hardware description that can then be you know produced so that the silicon itself is optimized like for these you know super cost sensitive high volume applications that you described earlier 
Yeah, sure. I think so. I got a, a good answer for you, which is um, I point your your listeners over to the TVM stack um, from University of Washington. It's now a Apache project, so you can find it there. The idea there is, um, in short, there's a lot of a lot of really good innovation happening there. But one of their outputs is, for example, Verilog, a, a capacity to generate essentially custom hardware for the TVM program, if you will. That that it's compiling. So that is already starting to happen. And um, I, people like Microsoft today already deploy, uh, you know, FPGAs into their data centers. Um, I don't know exactly what models they run, but targeting specific models. Again, uh, I, so it's happening. And I think you we can well expect for certain use cases for this to continue to happen. The trade-off, of course, is that you're making a strong commitment to a... Uh, essentially to a piece of hardware. Now, an FPGA right. gives you flexibility, but you're really committing yourself to a particular instantiation of a network in a market that is like highly dynamic, right? Yeah, People are yeah. changing the networks all the time. So that's a trade-off, right? Is And so that's the balance we're trying to strike is designing, for example, our tensor accelerator hardware. Um, we've got a first generation in the marketplace now, and you can well expect it to continue to evolve. Um where we're trying to find that point where we provide very high performance experiences and the right amount of flexibility. So going back to what I was saying earlier, okay, I'm an app developer. I want maximum flexibility on my platform. I want to run any one of an, any neural network that has you know hundreds of operators in it. Okay, that's one use case. And I want to take my same basic design and workflow and I want to design a home speaker, let's say, or a you know, thermostat or whatever. And I got a much more limited set of use cases, but I also have limit, more limited compute and more limited memory. Mm, you know, mm -hmm. can we serve both? And so, you know, the compiler, the distiller will serve the, you know, IoT or embedded or purpose-built device use case. And the same accelerator building blocks that we're building and the same accelerator hardware will also be available for your smartphone, for your automobile, whatever, where it's not so clear that the, exact use cases kind of boil down. And so I, instead of focusing, you know, on say FPGAs and a home speaker, I think the direction will be, how do we use tiny ML techniques? How do we use compression? How do we innovate on the hardware so that we can provide this high performance experience, you know, and a design sort of approach that, that meets the sort of memory power constraint cost point for these use cases. One more thing that I wanted to be sure to cover, and it's yeah. related to everything that we've been talking about. Qualcomm's been pretty active in the Onyx community. How does that play with all of the, the other ecosystems that we've been discussing? And we can take a step back, you know, to, and, and describe for folks that don't know it, Onyx and, yeah. you know, maybe kind of an update on, you know, what's sure. been going on with it. That's that's good. That's a good foundation. So Onyx, um, I don't know, started maybe roughly a year and a half ago, something like that, um, set forth by Microsoft, Facebook, and um, Amazon. And we were asked at the very early stages to join. And we were, I think, the first mobile SOC vendor to join and the first mobile SOC vendor to make Onyx converters into our accelerator framework uh, shipping product. So, um, so we real deep, uh, sort of interaction with Onyx, but what is the sort of idea? The idea was to provide, a you know, open standard, if you will, it's an open source project, uh, interchange format. So that going back to your question about what do we recommend to our customers in terms of how to bring inference to devices? Well, again, going back maybe 12 or 18 months, the the issue was that all these training frameworks had different paradigms, different file formats, different ways of interchanging data. So Onyx's kind of first kind of principal idea was, okay, let's define an interchange format so I can move easily from PyTorch to CAFE or PyTorch to TensorFlow and so on. And so by and large, I think it's achieved that. Translation between these frameworks that have different sets of operators and different assumptions is always a bit tricky. But um, we do have customers that come to us and want to run Onyx-produced models. And the nice thing is that it's helped with this funnel I talked about earlier. A lot of frameworks, Chain or others, have adopted Onyx support. And so now the fact that we support Onyx as one of the on-ramps to our SOCs means that we've actually opened up 
the number of training frameworks our customers can use so long as they can come through that Onyx kind of gateway. And so um, we're seeing quite a bit of interest um, in using that as an on-ramp to our um, to our products. And we're also chairing the Onyx Edge working group. And so the idea there is to define uh, in broad strokes um, what and this goes also back to the data center discussion we had. The set of operators you want in a data center, um, generally a lot richer than the set of operators that you need in practice on an edge device, whether that's a, a mobile device or IoT device. And so part of the work of the edge working group is to define sort of a, a subset, a strict and defined subset of the full set of Onyx operators that we define as sort of a conformance set for Edge. Mm, so if mm -hmm. you said, I'm Onyx Edge 1.0, although we don't really coin this term, but think about it that way, yeah. compliant, then I support these 65 operators and they work in this way and we can you know, write a sort of compliance test around it, right? And then interoperability becomes a lot more meaningful because today, one of the issues when somebody says that they're Onyx compliant is, okay, which of the 130 plus operators, whatever the number is today, do you actually support? And mm -hmm. is that is that combination meaningful for use cases that you want to deploy to the edge? Right, right. So that's our involvement. Again, the big theme here is w we want to be able to talk about what does compliance mean? What does it mean to support AI at the edge? Um, how do you make it le reduce the friction for our customers to do that, right? We've covered a lot of ground, a lot of very fun digressions, uh, I yeah. must say. Uh, anything else that you wanted to make sure we covered? Look, I just appreciate the opportunity to to be on the show and to um, on your podcast and to you know reach out to your your audience. Um, I'm really excited about about you know where things are going. Um, uh, a bit of a, a pitch, I think, maybe for the company. I'm proud of, proud of the company and, and what we do um this is a big systems problem you know it, it, ai i view it as a real paradigm shift in computing and it's a big systems problem but by that i mean that i don't think you can just look at just the edge or just a piece of silicon or just a m piece of middleware and deduce from that you know what are the implications across the whole thing this is a pervasive kind of technology shift we're undergoing and it's i think fundamentally going to change how we build computing systems and how we build you know all the systems that were you know, all automated devices that exist today and then all the ones that are going to be invented and so when we think about this when the you you know your your listeners you know, interact with your podcast i'd encourage them to be thinking about um, you know, you're going to have various experts and those experts rightfully so, you know, focus on a, a slice of this. But when we think about in total an end to end system, I think it's really important if we're going to like our focus is on, you know, high performance, low power, let's say to put it in a soundbite that requires huge amounts of innovation in the algorithms and the architecture of networks in the hardware, in the middleware, like we talked about, um, that's a big problem. And that's, basically the problem that that we're trying to tackle that i'm deeply involved in and uh excited to see where this goes you know takes a lot of people I mean, we have to work with our ecosystem partners to make it happen but uh really excited at the rate of progress we're seeing and just really excited about you know what's going to come as we enable more of these capabilities for people to innovate on well jeff thanks so much for being on the show Oh, absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Should do it again in, you know, some period of time and we can reflect back on what are these predictions came true and which ones, uh, you know, fell flat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. You have a good day. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. If you like what you've heard here, please do us a favor and tell your friends about the show. And if you haven't already hit that subscribe button yourself, Make sure you do so you don't miss any of the great episodes we've got in store for you. Thanks again to Qualcomm for their sponsorship of today's episode. Check them out at twimlai.com slash Qualcomm. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.